Last week, I talked about Kim Dae-jung, who was the president of South Korea after running three other times and, and not winning the election. And he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2000. And I want to share a poem that was read when he received this award. It's by Gunnar Roldvam. It's a Norwegian poet, writer from Stravanger. And he wrote this poem, The Last Drop. Once upon a time, there were two drops of water. One was the first, the other the last. The first drop was the bravest. The one I could quite fancy being the last drop, the one that makes everything run over so that we get our freedom back. But who wants to be the first drop? I love that poem because it, it says to me, it takes courage to be that first drop. It takes courage to move beyond the norm to not run with the crowd. It takes courage to, to not just try to fit in, to not worry what others think of us. And Kim Dae-jung did that so beautifully in his life in trying to bring the dividedness of North and South Korea together. It's a choice of love over fear which is our theme for this year. Choose love over fear. It requires us to be vulnerable. It, it requires us to be authentic. Brene Brown says in The Gifts of Imperfection, authenticity is not something we have or don't have. It's a practice, a constant choice of how we want to live. Authenticity is the daily practice of letting go of who we, are th who we think we're supposed to be and embracing who we are. And who are we? Who are we? Unity's second principle says we are the spark of the divine, that we have the spark of the divine within us, that we are spirit that we are spiritual beings. We're pure potential, but we don't, often we don't see it. We don't recognize it. Richard Rohr is a Franciscan priest who I follow his blogs, and last week in my spiritual direction program, we were given an assignment to watch one of his videos from a class that he taught several years ago. And in the class, he talks about the true self versus the false self. And the false self is where we, most of us live, most of the time. We have our identities, we are always longing, we long to, to, to look to the future instead of living in the present. To look for some future reward for being good that we may get to heaven someday. But the true self knows that we are already one with spirit, that heaven is right here in the now. And we often just get glimpses of this. Most of the time we live in the false self with our identities. But once we've gotten a glimpse of that true self, that authentic self, that self that knows who we are, that we will often have this dance in our lives of living between the true and the false self. And the more time we can spend in the true self, the more present we will be to love, to love's presence, to spirit's presence. The more authentic we can be, the more we know that we belong, instead of trying to fit in. And it's okay to live in the false self. We, we do this, uh, mo most of us live in the false self a lot of the time. And it's okay as long as we don't believe it. As long as we don't believe that that's all there is. 
Because the true self knows this. The true self knows who we are. The true self knows there's no end goal. Heaven is right here, and the wellsprings of joy are within us. And he says that we have to practice dying before we actually give up this body. We have to practice dying to that false self. He says in a blog just this week, it's not about becoming spiritual beings nearly as much as about becoming human beings. I love that he, that he mentioned that just this week because I've been studying the Gospel of Philip and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, and in both of them, they talk about how Jesus, Jesus didn't come here to teach us how to be spiritual. He came to teach us how to be human, how to fully live our humanity. What does it mean to be a true human? To be, it's to be fully human and fully divine to live between those false and true selves, to embrace all of ourselves, to see with the eyes of the heart. The more we can live from that true self, the greater perspective we can have, the broader perspective. The more we see that God in every single person we encounter. And Richard Rohr talked in the class about how if we can't see God, Spirit, universe, life, in the here and now, in every situation, we can't see it at all. Because it's here. It's now. We need to live a wholehearted life where we put all of the focus on this. When we do that, we know who we are, we know whose we are. And so this year, we've chosen this theme of choose love over fear. And when I Googled choose love over fear, this blog post came up about the 10 guideposts to wholehearted living, which is based on Brene Brown's work, The Gifts of Imperfection. Choose love over fear. And so... We've decided that we're going to do a 10-week talk series on the 10 guideposts to wholehearted living. And this first week is about being authentic, cultivating authenticity and releasing the need to feel that we fit in, letting go of what other people think not worrying about what other people think. It's really hard. It's about being that first drop instead of the last drop that goes along with the crowd. Brene Brown says in this chapter about being authentic, cultivating authenticity, to remind ourselves to don't shrink and don't puff up, to just stand on your sacred ground. Know who you are. Know who you are as a human being, as a spiritual being. Stand in that authenticity. Let it go. And maybe we're still afraid of what other people will think, but don't let it matter. When we stand in that authenticity, that authentic self of us, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. We stand in spite of the fear. This month, as Janice mentioned, is Black History Month, February. It's a call to honor and legitimize our black brothers and sisters, to remember the past and our culture, the culture of African Americans, so as not to forget it. And one of the people that I was reading about this week was Mammy Till Mobley. Maybe you've heard of Mammy Till. She's the mother of Emmett Till. Mammy was a black woman who was 
born in Mississippi, lived in Mississippi when she was two. Her parents migrated to the north and settled in Chicago area. Mammy had a son named Emmett. And Emmett lived his life in the Chicago area where the hate wasn't as hateful to black young men. Emmett wanted to go to Mississippi to visit his cousins to fish. And his mom was, Mammy was really afraid to let him go. She knew what Mississippi was like. And at first she said no, but she saw the desire in his eyes. The, he longed to go. And she was, a, she was a single mom at this point. Her husband had, had joined the army. It was either that or prison. And he joined the army. And two years into being in the army overseas, he was... He was convicted of a crime and, and executed. One of the things that was sent back to Mammy after he died was a ring with his initials on it. And she gave it to Emmett, her son. She knew that Emmett would want this ring. So Emmett ends up going to Mississippi. His mom is teaching him how to behave as a black young man, a black teenager in Mississippi, how to treat the whites. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Put your head down. Let them pass on the side. Move yourself off the sidewalk. Put your head down. Don't look them in the eye. While Emmett was there, They went to a grocery store, he and his cousins, to buy some candy. And he whistled. Later that evening, the grocery store clerk's husband and his brother-in-law showed up at Emmett's house and kidnapped Emmett. They beat him, they mutilated his body, they lynched him, they killed him. Because he had the audacity to whistle. The clerk had said that he whistled at her, that he had grabbed her waist and propositioned her. Mammy found out from the cousin that her son was missing. It was some time before they found his body in the river with barbed wire around it, with a fan attached to that wire. And the sheriff in Mississippi wanted to bury his body there, right there in Mississippi. He didn't want anyone to see the body. But Mammy got on the phone and started making a lot of phone calls and got Mayor Daley involved in Chicago, and they got the body to come back to Chicago. She wanted to bury her son. And when the casket got there, it was sealed. And she wanted to open it, and they said, no, we can't open it, it's sealed. And she said, get me a crowbar, I don't care. What more could they do to me? They've killed my son. And they opened the casket and she saw what they had done to her son. She decided that other people needed to see this. So she had an open casket viewing. Thousands of black people showed up, thousands. Many fainted, many cried to see this body of this 14-year-old. She had a magazine there 
Jet magazine take photos, the only magazine that she allowed photos to be taken. It was, Jet was a, a magazine that was, that was distributed to a black population. For 30 years, mostly only black people saw what was done to Emmett Hill, Emmett Till. Mammy became a activist, a speaker for the NAACP. She stood up. She didn't care what people would do to her. In her fear, she knew what she had to do, though, to speak out against this kind of hate. She gave many speeches across the country, faced the fears of going to the South and giving speeches there. She became a teacher, teaching young black children how to have a voice, how to stand up for themselves, how to speak. And because of what she did in her bravery and being that authentic self, Rosa Parks, a few months later, refused to give up her seat on a bus. And Martin Luther King Jr. started standing up in nonviolent ways to speak against these hate, hateful crimes. Mammy said in a, a speak speech that I saw her give in 2002, just a month before she passed away, that she had forgiven her son's killers, that she had a voice in her head that she knew was God telling her to do what she did, to have an open casket, to let people see what hate can do. And she's known as being the beginning of the current, the civil rights movement. It takes bravery. It takes being that first drop. She had forgiven them. They were acquitted after one hour of jury deliber de deliberation, a whole, whole white jury. But they admitted a year later that they had done it. And the woman who, the grocery store clerk, renounced her story, that it never happened. Just in 2020, the, the House voted to pass the Emmett Hill anti-lynching law. Emmett Till, I keep saying Hill. Emmett Till anti-lynch, in 2020, that lynching is a federal hate crime now. It's taken us a long time to get here, and we have a long way to go. But it takes all of us to stand in our authenticity, to stand in our truth, to listen to that guidance within, that spirit speaking to us and longing for us to be who we came here to be, as Ma Mammy Till did. Another young woman, Evelyn Glennie, is a deaf solo percussionist. And her real aim in life, I watched one of her TED Talks yesterday, her real aim in life is to teach people how to listen, teach the world how to listen. How, her TED Talk is called How to Truly Listen. When she was eight, she started taking piano lessons and clarinet lessons, and she had this passion for music. By the time she was 12, she was nearly deaf, and the doctors and other people told her she would never be a professional musician because she couldn't hear. But she didn't let that stop her. She stood her ground. She knew that her longing, her spirit within her wanted to be a professional musician, and she became the first soloist, solo percussionist 
She's Scottish. She's born in Scotland. She's got a beautiful Scottish accent if you watch her TED Talk. She went to the Royal Academy of Music in London and auditioned to be part of that school, and they initially turned her down because she was deaf. And she said, wait a minute. Why are you, I can hear, I just can't hear through my ears. I hear with my whole body. She often performs in her bare feet or stocking feet because it's the vibrations that she feels. So they let her audition again. And since that time, musical academies in the UK do not base their, their application um, admittance on whether someone can hear, whether someone has arms or legs. It's all, all based on the performance and the passion of the musician. Evelyn's got 28 honorary doctorates, many awards. She owns over 3,500 percussion instruments. She's made many albums, numerous recordings, performances, talks, books. She is making a difference because she listened to her inner voice. She listened to her, the spirit within her, the guidance within her that said, this is yours to do. Teach people how to listen, not with just their ears, but with their whole hearts, with their whole bodies. She said she had a message of don't let others limit who you are. Be who you are meant to be. Be who you came here to be. This isn't easy. It's not, it's not easy to go against the crowd. We, we all want to fit in. I found this a couple weeks ago when I was in Mexico with my sisters. I wanted to fit in with my sisters. And we had different, we have different beliefs. We have different levels of caution when it comes to the pandemic. And I wanted to fit in. but I chose to be my authentic self, to stand in my truth, to, to cultivate that first guidepost, to be authentic, to not worry what others think. Yesterday I was journaling and in my journal, when I'm journaling, things just come out that I don't expect. And I was writing that how the truth is, none of us know what anyone thinks. We don't know what they think. So why are we basing our perception of ourselves based on what others might be thinking about us? I only can think what I think they think, <laughs> if that makes any sense. You know, it's like the man behind the curtain in The Wizard of Oz that Toto pulls the curtain back. The wizard has this perception of himself, this, this perception that he wants others to have of him. He's not being his authentic self. He's creating this perception of being the great Wizard of Oz. We all have that man behind the curtain in us that's afraid of living our truth, of living into our authentic selves. And the truth is when people tell us what they think, they're not really necessarily telling the truth with a capital T, they're telling us from where they are in consciousness. So don't take it personally. If we're to believe Don, Michael, Don Miguel Ruiz, who wrote The Four Agreements, don't take anything personally, the good or the bad. Because people say and speak 
and share from where they are in consciousness, not from where we are. It's much simpler and much more freeing to live authentically, to live who we came here to be, to stop the pretense and just be ourselves. It's freeing, but it's not easy. But when we can do that, we can stop identifying with this false self and live from that true self that knows we are one. We are one with each other. We are one with spirit. One with, sto- with source, expressing as this body, this person, this in the right now, in this moment, I am Sue McQueen expressing as my consciousness, where my consciousness is right now, but always reaching towards living from my potential. And we're invited to do that. We're all invited to do that all the time, to live authentically, to live from our true selves, to dance more on that side than the false side that has to compare and compete and judge. There's more peace in that the more we come back to the true self, the more we allow ourselves to be authentic. There's more freedom there. And the bigger difference we'll make when we're that first drop, like Mammy Till, like Evelyn Glennie. Who did you come here to be? Are you living an authentic life? True being, true human being catches glimpses of its true self. We're here to embrace our full selves our wholeness, to live freer, more fuller lives from our potential, but we have to be willing to embrace it. We have to be willing to let go of what other people think. Rumi has this poem that I just love. He says, if you want the moon, do not hide from the night. If you want a rose, Do not run from the thorns. If you want love, do not hide from yourself. Because we are all that love, that true self. We're invited to be all we were meant to be, not what someone else tells us to be, not based on others' opinion of us. It requires us to be vulnerable to embrace our whole selves, to accept ourselves as we are, and to stand on our sacred ground. Namaste. Peace be with you.